Welcome to No Apologies on Beck, where we are unafraid to speak the truth. I am your host, Rick Becker, and our co-host, Lori Hintz. Thank you very much. How is it possible we have another great show? I know, right? We've got so much planned for you today. They this just is going to be a good show. never end. We have not spilled who our guest is yet, either. I think it's the best kept secret on Beck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is. So, are, we, are you going to say or no? Uh, yeah, we can say who. Do it. Okay. Uh, we have with us State Auditor Josh Gallion today. So, we'll be talking to him shortly about all sorts of interesting things. So, look forward to that. So, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. First topic today is we are going to talk about a term of which people may not have heard before, and it is called nullification. And I think you're going to be able to set the table pretty well for people on this one. For those who have never heard the term or do not know what it is, what exactly, Rick, is nullification? Right. So the idea of nullification is that when the states came together to form the Constitution to create a federal system, mm -hmm. they recognized that the federal system must follow the Constitution. Right. But in the event that laws were derived on a federal level that were not constitutional, that there would be a way for the states to, in, in effect, nullify them to make them not so, not... Veto them? Uh, be, not veto, veto, but... veto them within the confines of the state. Got it. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Jefferson was big on this. Uh, some of the other founding fathers, the, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions specifically included I think we have a, a graphic of that, the old Kentucky legislature back in, I think it was 1798. To me, this seems like something whereby it is sovereign nation types or sovereign state issue, mm -hmm. and you're talking about grassroots up or bottom up rather than top down. Am I wrong? No, you're exactly right. Well, when we're talking about, when you say grassroots or bottom up, you're talking about the states right. versus the federal government. Correct. Yeah, in the Kentucky legislature, they spell it out pretty clear there. Whenever, whensoever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. That's, that's complete essence of nullification. Perfect. Now, there have been um, Supreme Court cases where nullification has been struck down. Now, as we think about nullification today, there, there are different ways to think about it. The Supreme Court has made it clear that when there's a federal law, there's the, the supremacy, federal supremacy. Right. And so anything that's federal, the states can't say, no, it's legal. But what they can do is nullify in a different way. We can say, for instance, Yes, go ahead. It's, it's federal law, but for our state, it's not against the law. That's one way, and that we see that with um, marijuana sure. is, the, is the clearest example of that. I mean, look at what's been happening with marijuana. That is, in effect, nullification that's been taking place over years, and it has pushed the federal government into, which we talked about recently, the U.S. House passing in a, a, a bill uh, for marijuana, and uh, we'll see what happens in the Senate. But mm -hmm. the point is that the states drove it by their version of nullification. Now, it was still illegal federally. If federal agents came in, if the Attorney General, say Jeff Sessions at the time, was, was anti-marijuana, if he had sent federal agents, federal troops, uh, ATF in, uh, people could be prosecuted and jailed uh, for a federal crime, even though it was legal in the state. Right. That's one way of, of doing it. The other way is to say, um, no, we're not even saying that it's legal here. We understand the, the supremacy clause, but what we're going to do is say we disagree with it because we feel it's unconstitutional, and therefore it's at our, our very minimal uh, requisite duty to at least say we're not going to have our people, our state law enforcement, our local law enforcement enforce the federal law that we disagree with. Now, there are a wide variety of views on marijuana across the United States, like a ton of, like everybody has something different pretty much. I mean, there's a lot of, of variation amongst the states. It's, there's no one federal marijuana law. Right, exactly. Let's pull up a graphic. Uh, we've got the graphic of the United States. If you look, I mean, the, talk <laughs> about effective nullification. I mean, marijuana like quilt. is, yes, <laughs> it, it's, it's absolutely uh, sweeping the nation, and I suspect that it's going to uh, come into North Dakota as well mm -hmm. with our surrounding states. I'm not sure if that map is even fully updated, but uh, with South Dakota and Montana joining the bandwagon on recreational and, and uh, Canada having it, uh, and Minnesota being medical, I mean, it, it's just a matter of time. So now if we let's flip over to it. We have another graphic because another 
uh, topic for nullification are what are called uh, Second Amendment sanctuary states or sanctuary counties. Um, some, some, uh, another term for it, which I actually like better, is a uh, Second Amendment, um, uh, what is it called? Well, it's anyway, it's pro se sec Second Amendment preservation. Preservation. Right, because oh, sanctuary that, brings <laughs> about the idea of, of the, the whole like uh, Los Angeles things, and yeah, San right. Francisco right. Uh, immigrant sanctuaries. But you've got a lot of co counties and some states in there that are saying, look, we are not going to enforce laws that are more restrictive on a federal level with regard to firearms uh, than what we have in our state. And uh, in other areas, in some states, they're saying, as long as all of the gun parts and the gun is made within our state and sold within our state, the government has, the federal government has no control over that whatsoever. And so we can ignore oh. your federal laws based on the interstate commerce clause as it's interpreted today. That makes me just think that we just need manufacturers of guns in North Dakota. And, yeah, <laughs> in, in, in all 50 states. So, um, so and in fact, it's interesting, in North Dakota, we had... In 2019, I put a bill in uh, mm -hmm. for that would have made North Dakota a Second Amendment preservation state where it would have said, look, we get it, uh, federal government, you want to have potentially more restrictive laws. They're looking at doing a lot of new things. And with uh, Joe Biden coming in uh, and, and uh, Kamala Harris, I expect there'll be more restrictive uh, laws. Mm -hmm. the, the, the bill said we recognize that, but we're not going to have our state police and our local police enforce the federal law. That's fine, you can, you can still have it, but you're gonna have to bring in your own people. And that makes sense to me. Right, right, how well was it received? Um, it, was, it was marginal, it didn't, it didn't pass, it got mixed reviews. Mm -hmm. There were concerns uh, with law enforcement. I find that law enforcement lobbyists and, and, and what I call brass, the administrative, they're, they're very reluctant to change how they're doing things. Right. Um, and there were some concerns about, well, if there are drugs involved, can, or does that prohibit us from being involved with drugs just because guns are also involved? So there were some legitimate questions. I think it's reasonable to bring it back mm -hmm. uh, in, in 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping someone does, perhaps I will. And there was also, I think it was 2013, uh, uh, this, a similar bill, mm -hmm. uh, which, which also didn't pass. But So we're looking at those types of things. Um, but I think there's a, another aspect to nullification, which we normally, as we've just discussed, talked about with regard to states versus the federal government. Mm -hmm. There's another level of it, and, it's, and, and we're seeing it play out with localities, municipalities, meaning primarily counties, but also uh, city governments versus the state. Wow, just local level. Local, right. I mean, if, if you look at um, the, the sheriff in, in Mississippi refusing to enforce mask mandates and, uh, and social gathering, some of the New York sheriffs California Even had one too. California, they, recently. they said there's no way we're going to enforce the social distancing right. and gathering when it comes to Thanksgiving. Utah, Arizona, a lot of these people are rising up. North Dakota is listed uh, as a, one of the places where some of the sheriffs have said we're not going to enforce, enforce these type of, types of things. In addition, um, just Monday night, New Salem City Commission voted to amend their contract with Morton County uh, Sheriff's Department wow. to not enforce Burgum's mandates when it comes to early bar closings and capacities. And you know, kudos to them. I think that is absolutely amazing and an appropriate way to see nullification in effect. Nullification, now you've learned something new. Well, coming back, we will have our guest in studio and we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of questions for Josh Gallion. So we'll be talking to him up next. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink from trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com. 
Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes these roads are the best in the county. Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. For the greatest selection and full menu offering, it's the Four Season Restaurant and Ice Cream Parlor in Garrison. Succulent sandwiches, big breakfast served all day, and delicious desserts. Easy access in and out for campers and RVs. The Four Season Restaurant at the top of Main Street, Garrison. Are you a thrill seeker, sightseer, or day tripper? The Ford Bronco Sport SUV is built for you. Ford Bears Casino is giving away a 2021 Ford Bronco Sport loaded with a ton of interior space, safari style roof, smooth suspension for any terrain, and easy to clean surfaces. Qualify now just by playing your favorite slots at Ford Bears Casino. Double points on Sundays. Also get in on Super Senior Wednesdays, slot turning Thursdays, and hot seats on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Spin into Ford Bears Casino and Lodge for chances to win. things in life are hard. That's why banking shouldn't be. Cornerstone Bank. Welcome back to No Apologies on Beck. I am your host, Rick Becker, and we have a special guest tonight, Josh Gallion, North Dakota State Auditor. So happy to have you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So, what brings you here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, we invited okay. him, Rick. So oh, we did. So let me, I'm going to be, a, I'm going to act like the host. Lori told me I had to be here. Did so she? I, yes. All well, right. I was really excited to ask you about rewarding uh, good behavior because yes. I think that is a much better, you're, you're a parent of young girls. Mm -hmm. You know what it's like to try to get somebody motivated to do something, especially I was a young girl, so I know how hard it is to motivate me. Mm -hmm. And so you realize that at some point you can punish or you can reward. And it's, you know what, they say a lot more, what is it, flies with honey rather than vinegar. Mm -hmm. So I think, that's, I think that's a great thing that the auditor's office is doing. Well, I appreciate it, and and yes, we, we're trying to we're trying to reward or recognize the behavior that we want to see in others. Uh, and so we we took on this this award, and we wanted to present this to Devil's Lake. Uh, one of our audit managers, again, any any process, it takes great people to get this done. And and one of our audit managers, Heath Erickson, um, he's been in our office now for many many years, but he's been working with the city of Devil's Lake for I think nearly ten years. They've been been our client and trying to help educate them. Uh, support them. From the city side, though, it takes it takes a willingness and an, and an interest in learning right. how to prepare the schedules, the financial statements, these notes, and it, it takes a level of expertise and knowledge mm -hmm. to do so. And, and Heath has been working with with Devils Lake City Auditor for all of this time. And not only did she get to the point where she could produce all of these reports and and do this, but to get through one of Heath's audits. With a clean audit, that is a tremendous feat, and so we thought, let's let's recognize that uh, a major accomplishment. And so, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. It's great from the auditor's standpoint where we get to deliver good news, because mm -hmm. normally if you're going to hear from us, um, <laughs> sometimes it's less than less right. than positive. But uh, you know, again, I believe that the auditor's office's role is. Transparency. Well, and I want to forming the citizens. I want to compliment you on the transparency because I don't remember previously before you held this office getting as much communication. I'm, I'm you know, also privy to some information for you know one of the other job, many other jobs that mm -hmm. I do. But um, I will have to say that I love getting press releases from your office. They're clean, 
clear, yeah. concise. There are, and and you have you have a Facebook page. Did the yes. auditor's office before you were there have a Facebook page? No. See, no. okay, so now you know. North Dakota citizens that you can get all sorts of information about the auditor's office just by looking on Facebook, which you're on mm -hmm. way too much already anyway. So uh, let's pop that up on the screen and we'll, we'll see what it looked like. You had uh, an announcement that you put on your website and that yes. shows up so everybody can see what's going on. And I love this idea of calling it a stewardship award. That, it, that goes to my Christian church going heart mm -hmm. because I know what stewardship is. Stewardship is making sure you're using what you're given the right way. Correct. It's perfect, it's a perfect name for that. And, and being public officials, we are being provided taxpayer resources. And so to make sure that these individuals that we trust with, with these, uh, the money and, and, and everything that they're being, being given, are they doing it properly? Right. And are they doing everything they can to try to make sure that they are accountable to the people? Right. And so for us, making sure that put, you know, putting that information in the citizens' hands uh, one of the things a lot of people thank me for is trying to hold government accountable, and I have to inform them and, and let them know it. that's not actually what we do. Uh, our job is to make sure that we provide independent, objective information to the citizens so that the citizens can hold government accountable. Excellent. That is, that is why we push so hard for uh, communication. We try to put information out there. Mm -hmm. uh, my hope is that people would come to our Facebook page, our website, not for information about the auditor's office, but mm -hmm. for information about the governments that, that we all rely on. Excellent. Uh, whether it's local governments or state governments. Now, when you gave this award to Devil's Lake, I bet they were pretty excited about it. What Did you have any sort of a ceremony or anything? We can pop up on the screen we, and show what it looks like. This is yes. the City of Devil's Lake Stewardship Award. So I would have loved to have done this in person mm -hmm. and drive up there and present this to the city at one of their city commission meetings. However, uh, with, with everything going on, we did it via, um, I think, a, a, a Zoom call sure. or a, um, you know, virtual. And we were given an opportunity to explain kind of why and what this was for and, and recognize that city auditor for her years of effort trying to get to this point. So it was it was a lot of fun um, to try to present this and I think they were a little, at first, a little you know, stunned. Mm -hmm. Taken aback. Right? Yeah. So uh, if you, you have given this initial one, <laughs> are there more to come? Well, we, I, you know, as a teaser, we, we are looking at one other potential to recognize uh, some contributions, and, and I'll say that's about as much as we can say right now. Oh, I love teases like that. I think, awesome. it's, I think it's smart, really smart to do this, because with you at the helm of the auditor's office, we have seen a great deal of transparency, a great deal of accessibility. And like you said, the, the nature of the job is to, if you will, ferret out the stuff that's concerning. And I mean, that's, that's just the nature of it. And so you do ferret out stuff that's concerning, that gets brought up, and it's good to balance, because before when it's not quite as public, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter, but when people hear about some of the concerns, it's good for them to hear about some of the very good things, and it's good for people who are doing well, apparently in the face of Heath's audits, <laughs> to, uh, to be rewarded. So tell me. Did, he is did, thorough. He, he is very good at do, what he does. When agencies hear that Heath is going to be their auditor, do they complain? Do they no. like, no? No, the way he <laughs> handles this, uh, he is very approachable, and he, he wants to work with people to make sure we are helping to improve government. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's his focus, and that's why it's, it's great to be able to work with people like, like him every day. Um, because yeah, he truly approaches his job and he understands that auditing is, is it's not an, a, an easy task and it's not always light, but he goes in with that, you know, that servant's heart and mm -hmm. mindset is he's here to try to help make, you know, these local government entities better. Can you talk about your office just a little bit and tell me how many folks you um, oversee? I mean, I know that you have such a widespread purview over so mm -hmm. many different things. I can't even imagine uh, how many different things that you have to audit, but uh, talk about your office just a little bit then. So we were recently on a call with the state of Tennessee and, and they were talking about the North Dakota Auditor's Office and, and they were explaining how they kind of keep track of a lot of things we're doing through the social media. And um, they, they use a line, I think my deputy has it written on our board that says, North Dakota is small but mighty. Small but oh, nice. mighty. Oh, yeah, so we are, we are 58 uh, FTEs, full-time employees, we, we employ interns, and so we're actively always trying to reach out to you know, college students to get them in, to introduce them to the world of auditing. Mm -hmm. 
but we're responsible for auditing state government, um, and there's over 80 agencies. 80 agencies. State agencies. Some of those are, are bid out to private firms, mm -hmm. um, like the Bank of North Dakota. Uh, we also are, are responsible for several audits of local government entities, and those are about 45 every year. But there are nearly 1,900 local government entities across the state of North Dakota that that we either are required to have an audit or what's done is a small government review, meaning they submit financial documentation and then we take a look at it and verify that nothing. That is a tremendous amount of information it's a, it's a for 58 of, people. It's a and lot even of, if you're ferreting uh, things uh, out, that's uh, a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of information. Now we've got like just about a minute left in this sure. segment. So one of the things that I think is confusing uh, is how higher ed fits in with what you do. Can you just kind of explain, because there's so much money that goes In to one higher minute. ed. In one minute. In one minute. Um, <laughs> you know, universities, uh, they're a state agency. So they go through the same audit process as, as you know, your normal Department of Transportation. They're required to get a two-year audit. We have a team that, that conducts those. Um, it can be challenging, especially in the days of FERPA and access to records, but, uh, but we've good people and, and they get it done. Tell, tell our, our viewers, what is FERPA? FERPA, oh gosh, that is a, a federal uh, federal education, gosh, of course you would ask me that right, on right, camera. Right. Uh, that the is privacy that, that, That's the privacy <laughs> restrictions on, okay. on certain student records. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you can't, you can't access some private information on them and so we have to be mindful of that as we're conducting our audits. If there is FERPA information involved, gotcha. we have to make sure that if we do access that record, that individual is notified and, and why we're looking at it. Gotcha. Excellent. How would you like to stay on for one more segment? <laughs> sure. I won't ask you any more about acronyms. Right, no right, no right. more acronyms? <laughs> okay. No. Okay, we're going to be John. back with more of Josh Galleon in just a minute. Stick with us. Ruins the neighborhood. Come on, humans, let's get this fixed. Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's best contractors. 258 2412. Online at America's Best Contractors Incorporated.com. In southwestern and south central North Dakota on any given day at any given moment, a Dakota Community Bank and Trust customer is logging in or signing on to do their online or mobile banking. We believe that community banking can blend both the past with down-home customer service in-house and the future with modern banking conveniences and technology for our customers anywhere, like here or here, all while honoring our long-standing tradition of community-first oriented banking here at Dakota Community Bank and Trust. My wife was diagnosed with uh, early stage Alzheimer's. We talked about it and we kind of decided we'd be a little bit proactive and try to start making provisions. So we started looking here and uh, even title worked out to be pretty much the perfect answer. I guess I, I didn't expect it to be so nice. The staff here were terrific. We enjoy it. They say, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. At OK Tire, we're here to keep you going. From Firestone tires and replacements to retreads and even Firestone tracks, we have you covered. Our certified Firestone experts are ready to get you back up and running, no matter if you're on site or in the field, saving you time and money. OK Tire, we keep the tough going. Now is the best time to plan for your 2021 farm equipment needs. North Dakota-based Summers Manufacturing is currently offering early order savings. Take advantage of big savings on North America's broadest tillage line, including the Super Colder Samurai and the innovative BRT Renegade, as well as the best-built, best-backed land rollers in the industry. Talk to your Summers dealer today or go to summersmfg.com to learn more about early order savings available on all Summers equipment.
Welcome back to No Apologies on Beck, your after hours oasis of sanity as evidenced by our highly esteemed guest, Josh Gallian, North Dakota State Auditor. I am your host, Rick Becker, our co-host, Lori Hintz. Thank you. I'm not sure why I'm sounding like an arena announcer I don't know, it, tonight. It, it was kind of cool. You have to have a mic come down and start talking. Uh, Josh, we were talking last time about FERPA. We figured out what FERPA is, which is super helpful. And then also, you uh, you mentioned in the break while they were not privy to this, you talked about something else that they, you know those 58 people have a lot of stuff to do, but do. you also do something. And I just got a, a press release on that just today. So one of the um, programs that we operate is the Federal Mineral Royalty Program. And all of the federal lease lands here in North Dakota, we verify that the uh, lease payments going to the federal government are accurate. Now, the benefit of looking at that information is we also make sure that the money coming back to the state is accurate for those local municipalities. And so uh, that's, a, that's a big program for the state, especially over the last five to ten years as the oil um, boom has happened. And so we just put out that press release that yeah, it says um, over 230 million in federal royalty payments mm -hmm. verified by state auditor's office for state and federal funding. Is this for recent or is this lagging a little so bit? So the, the, it does lag. I believe the, um, this is for the 15 and 16 mm -hmm. um, years. But what they look at is making sure that the, um, the, the companies that are leasing those federal um, mineral rights are paying the appropriate share of royalty payments. And so uh, there's a team of five auditors over there. Um, Doing some great work. Huge job. It 230 is. million. Big money. Is, yeah, it big is. money. Big exactly. money. So let me ask you, though, with all these agencies, um, I would imagine on a routine basis you have citizens that contact you, maybe, do. maybe legislators. So let me ask you a two part question. Okay. Which one or two agencies do you, are, are you finding that citizens are contacting you most frequently, asking questions or requesting an audit of some sort? Part two. Same question, but pertaining to legislators contacting you. Well, um, I would say probably both of the same agency right now. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions that, that I get and a lot of concerns that I hear about uh, really, you know, it comes to state lab and, and health department. Um, and I think that has to do with the, you know, the current situation. Gotcha. And are, and are people expressing specific concerns or they're just sort of saying things are uh, worrisome? They vary. Okay. You know, some of them are specific. Some people are just, you know, expressing some frustrations. And, and I understand a lot of those. Uh, the, the difficulty, though, when you, you think about an audit is we need a set of criteria, a standard that we can apply to make sure that things are happening properly. Um, one of the things that has come up quite often are the PCR tests. Mm -hmm. People are challenging the, the number of cycles on the PCR test. And, and I've talked to the state lab directly, and I've, um, I've talked to them and asked them, okay, what, what determines the number of cycles that, that they're running? You know, because again, I hear all this stuff, and they've indicated to me that they're following the manufacturer's recommendation. Mm -hmm. And some of the complaints. Which isn't a direct answer. <laughs> not, not necessarily, because again, I hear other people say that there's medical professionals out there that say you should run X number of cycles. Mm -hmm. From an auditor's perspective, again, we're, we're, not, we're not all medical people. Which one is right? Which standard do you apply? Sure. And, and that's the challenge, is if you don't have a clear set of criteria, a standard to apply, then is it really independent, objective information that you can rely on? Yeah. And, so, oh, and I, I would imagine, in my view, the health, department, the health department and specifically the state lab is making it much harder on themselves specifically because of a lack of transparency, a lack of being forthright. So, because I know of people who've called in, I've called in, I've had extensive communications, which we'll talk about on one of these shows. <laughs> um, but there's, there's this unwillingness to just give people what they're looking for, not to give them the answer they're looking for, but to not play games and to simply answer the question. Because when you're not being forthright, what happens is that you naturally are going to have that person is questioning and being skeptical and, yeah. and, and suspicious even to say, well, now we need to dig deeper. They're not, they're not answering a simple question. And, and I think that they are deriving a lot of the interest themselves by their own unwillingness to, to just be helpful. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know, you know, I guess I, I'm not going to ask you to comment on that, but <laughs> I, I do think I can understand why you're getting so many requests, and I think it's in large part to how they handle things themselves. How about the legislators? What are, what are their main requests? 
A lot of them are very similar to that, you know, talking about the tests and, and questioning things at the lab. And, you know, there are just some, there's some limitations on what an audit can accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, even if we did go in there and conduct an audit, if we started tomorrow, we're still not going to be, you know, done with this thing for months down the road. Right. And so when we look at it, months down the road, a lot of the issues that we're facing today, the executive orders that people are unhappy with, um, you know, these can all be ancient history by the time this is released. So really from, from an audit standpoint, our job is not to go in and, and investigate. We're, we're not investigators to second guess what's happening right now. The audit should be looked at as a tool, as a resource to go back and potentially evaluate how could we do it better going forward in the future. So in other words, I'm just going to paraphrase here for laymen like me, uh, you're a long game, not a short term agency. Correct. And, and really, right now, we're trying to create all of these processes. We have been thrust through a tremendous change. And to put the auditors in the middle of that right now is, is more or less just complicating an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think anybody, if they look at this thing, they're going to look back and think, okay, we could have done it a little bit better here. We could have tried this a little different here. But when you're in the middle of something and you're trying to address a huge need you know, public health concern. Um, people are trying to do the best they can. I, I, I try to believe that people are trying to, trying to do the right thing. Um, but there will be a time and a place for an audit. I, I would say right now in the middle of, of what's going on, this may not be the right time. Well, nothing's really clear cut either. No. I mean, the science isn't even settled. Now, so. I, I do want to say we appreciate the people bringing information to us. We take all of this information, all of these, um, you know, we'll call them complaints. Mm -hmm. We take them all serious, and we do take a look at, at you know, them, each one, but at this point, I just don't have anything that is, Well, maybe you can I use that say, down the road long-term forensically. Right. Yes. I mean, again, you know, we talked about state agencies and the audit, which so we do. The health department is one of our audit clients, mm -hmm. and so some of this information, while we may not jump into action right now, we may take a look at this. There might be an opportunity here where we can try to find some operational improvements at the state lab to help them improve the delivery of services for the citizens of North Dakota. So that, that's really at a point right now, that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, now, if something comes up and it's absolutely glaring and it's, and it's an, an issue, then, and then yes, we can look at performance audits and, and we could try to jump into action. But uh, with the information that, that I've been given, I, I think right now we'll, again, we'll focus on looking at it after the fact to see how we can help going forward. Gotcha. Well, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about, because North Dakota doesn't have an inspector general. No. How, how, for our viewers, how would your office differ from an inspector general? And is North Dakota missing out by He's not, not having... He's not an investigator. He's not well, an investigator. Well, but, but, well... I'm just paying attention to what the man is saying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It, it, you know, being more of an IG, that, that does change the dynamics because mm -hmm. uh, an inspector general has the ability to, um, you know, be that investigator type. Um, you know, I've been so focused on, on just trying to conduct the audits <laughs> that I haven't really dug into, into, you know, whether or not North Dakota is missing out. Yeah. I like to think that the auditor's office, we're, we're doing a lot of great work mm -hmm. within the confines and the, the, the statutory responsibilities we have. Um, it doesn't it. hurt to not have another layer office yeah. in the state government that we have to give uh, uh, whatever benefits and payment and more tax mm -hmm. dollars and more staff and. And I all really, that. I do appreciate the fact that you are so accessible. I think people feel a lot more comfortable calling your office, knowing that you're going to probably look into it for them. I mean, I think there is a, there's a confidence there that the, the the public is going to have on that. So thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. And absolutely, and uh, not to sing your praises too heavily, <laughs> because only one of us can, definitely came can on the right have show. a huge <laughs> ego. Um, but no, I think it's phenomenal your approach to government and what you see your role as uh, is phenomenal. It's 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 Thank textbook you. of the way elected officials should think and behave, and you should be commended. And there should be more like you. I can't say that enough times. A plus. Um, so I'm saying wow. that for the viewers, not for you. Yeah. Don't don't. <laughs> no, I concur. I absolutely agree with you too. 
It's absolutely uh, thank true. Thank you so much for coming yeah. on with Thanks us today. Thanks for having today. me. We really appreciate yeah, sure. it. And when we come back, we're going to do another brain food. So look forward to that. Howdy, folks. It's the Caroline Cafe. I reckon it's time you're due for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at a salad bar. Sink your teeth into our famous Caroline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a calm roll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Since opening in Hebron in 1940, Dakota Community Bank and Trust has been your hometown bank. Our mission has been to provide modern banking convenience with old-fashioned hometown service. We've grown with the communities we serve. Through year-round events, countless sponsorships, and nearly 7,000 hours of volunteering each year. Learn more about our 80-year history at dakotacommunitybank.com. Jeez, what a mess. Look at that. There's roof stuff everywhere. It's so embarrassing. Ruins the neighborhood. Come on, humans. Let's get this fixed. Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's best contractors. 258-2412. Online at americasbestcontractorsincorporated.com. For the greatest selection and full menu offering, it's the Four Season Restaurant and Ice Cream Parlor in Garrison. Succulent sandwiches, big breakfast served all day, and delicious desserts. Easy access in and out for campers and RVs. The Four Season Restaurant at the top of Main Street, Garrison. Are you a thrill seeker, sightseer, or day tripper? The Ford Bronco Sport SUV is built for you. Four Bears Casino is giving away a 2021 Ford Bronco Sport loaded with a ton of interior space, safari style roof, smooth suspension for any terrain, and easy surfaces. Qualify now just by playing your favorite slots at Four Bears Casino. Double points on Sundays. Also get in on Super Senior Wednesdays, slot turning Thursdays, and hot seats on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Spin into Four Bears Casino and Lodge for chances to win. things in life are hard. That's why banking shouldn't be. Cornerstone Bank. Welcome back to No Apologies on Beck. This segment we call Brain Food Cut is it because. Well, it's kind of. Hibbity hibbity. It's kind of our thing. Uh, our thing is uh, we like to educate people and yep. we like to raise the bar a little bit rather than lower it. And so we want to give you information about things that you may not know. And sometimes we use big words. You both, you, both you and I are kind of bad about that. I don't, do people make fun of you? I get make fun of mm -hmm. other places because of my vocabulary. Yes. You too? Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? Why would people make fun of you for using words that are germane? <laughs> I, think, I, I like, I, I get nerdy on it, and just like you do, my wife does, on, on fun words. Yep. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's perceived as you're trying to sound smarter than the next person or whatever. I just think it's fun when I learn a new word. Well, and I do too, and I, when I learn a new word, I try to make use of it. So, and mm -hmm. the trick is making sure that you put it in context and use it correctly. I mean, you could, <laughs> yeah, I've heard some other stuff sometimes, and it's not necessarily always in context. So, yeah. all right, so my first word tonight is called sophistry. And it made me think of it because it is a fallacious method of, of reasoning. And we talk about that on this show a lot. So uh, sophistry is a noun. The plural is sophistries. And it is a subtle, tricky, superficially plausible. And this is the, this is the word you need to pay attention to. 
superficially plausible. So on its face, it looks like it's a plausible, but generally fallacious, which is another word which you mean, or false um, method of reasoning. So false narrative would be sophistry, a false narrative, which is something that we deal with all the time right now in our lives in America and in North Dakota. So mm -hmm. sophistry, you can put it into a sentence and uh, it's a false argument or sophism. Right. And fallacious. And fallacious. It starts with an F. F. And false. False and looks good on the surface. Dig into it a little bit more and it's fallacious. Okay. I it's elected, when I saw that you went with good vocabulary words, I elected to go elsewhere because four vocabulary words is probably too much. That's true. So my first one is Governor Morris. Now, mm -hmm. Governor Morris is one of the founding fathers. And I think he's fabulous. Uh, I, I, I've read a couple of books on him. And uh, he, he is so quirky and interesting. There are a couple of things that, that a person needs to know about him. The two biggest ones that I recall from the books and so forth is he was this big, boisterous guy, and he had a peg leg. Oh. So he's a one-legged founding father, okay. uh, and he had a peg leg. He initially was burned as a, as a young guy, as a, an older child, I guess. Um, and recovered from the burns, but he had a horse carriage accident when he was run over by one of the wheels, and so they cut his leg off. Oh my. He was also, despite his corpulent, another word for you? Nice, very despite well Despite his corpulent nature mm -hmm. um, and, and his one leg, he was a ladies' man. No way. Yes. He got around the colonies, let me tell you. <laughs> He also was in Paris. He was, he was one of the uh, diplomats in Paris. Hmm. And he was having an affair with one of the countesses who was the, uh, the, the wife of one of the top guys in Paris. However, that lady was also the mistress to Talleyrand. Oh, good who, heavens. Yes. So Governor Morris and Talleyrand were sharing the same mistress of this other guy. It's important to know because Governor Morris, I'm sure, was doing his diplomacy because Talleyrand is the Frenchman who sold the Louisiana Purchase the Louisiana to Thomas Purchase. Jefferson. Yes, of course. Yes. Wow. Yes, absolutely. Interesting. Theodore Roosevelt wrote a biography about him. About uh, this governor? About, about, well, his first name is Governor. That's his name? Yes, yes. G -O governor, U Governor Morris. Oh, for heaven's yeah. sakes. I and thought that was his title. No, that was no, not no, even his not, title. No, that not was governor. His... He was the, he spoke the most at the constitutional conventions, hmm. which you don't even hear you about. You hear his name. He is responsible for the, the seven letter phrase uh, in the constitution, we the people of these United States, something of that nor wow. uh, nature. And um, he is responsible for the laying out New York City in its wow. grid. So tons of interesting Very things. Very interesting. Oh, Jenna. the last thing. Okay. This is going to, this is, this is crazy. Okay. So he had gout. He had the gout. Okay. Yeah. That's, a only had, that's a foot problem. Well, it's a, it's a uric acid problem. Okay. But uh, maybe that's another brain food item. Okay. Anyway, well, he had, had gout and it forms crystals and it, can, and it forms, can form crystals in your bladder. Right. He had a urinary tract blockage. He used a whalebone. Okay, I really don't need to hear any more about that because he, the visual enough is good. So okay, no, but listen, he used a whalebone to try and dig out his urinary tract blockage, caused complications by perforating himself, and died from those complications. Oh, wow. I what a kid way, you not. What a way to go. That's I know. awful. So, <laughs> that's, Governor yeah. Morris. You'll Governor never Morris. forget Governor Morris now as long Read as you live. Him. Thanks for the... Visual on that, that was lovely. Okay, I'm going to go to another word, and this one is uh, pugnacious. So pugnacious, if you are, it's an adjective, if you are pugnacious, you are inclined to quarrel or fight readily. So you're probably one of those people who's apt to just get into a battle, whether it is with your siblings or somebody else. Mm -hmm. And if you're pugnacious, you're going to be quarrelsome, belligerent, combative, you know, the type of people who leave us Facebook posts, you know, that's yes. that type of person. So if you are pugnacious, you are troublesome, quarrelsome, belligerent, cranky. Hmm. I think I know some pugnacious people. I think people. I do too, as a matter of fact. Do you effect. think that the pugs, the dog, is that named Makes after? Or is one after, one after the other? Are they related, do you think? I've never had a pug. I don't know if they are belligerent or troublesome. Maybe we'll have to have people weigh in probably on Facebook on that one and say, pugs are pugnacious. Yes. I don't know. 
Excellent. Thank okay. You. All right. My last item on brain food yep. is the Oxford comma. Oh, I have a very strong opinion on the Oxford comma. I'm not surprised. <laughs> so the Oxford comma, you know when you have three things listed right. in a sentence, you put down um, a, a comma behind, certainly behind the first and the second. For sure. The question is, do you put it down between the second and the word and for your third one? Absolutely. Okay. No question. Well, that one is called the Oxford comma. Right. And so, for instance, the, well, I'm going to get to that in a second. So one example is, my goals for 2018 are to learn how to use commas like a champion, comma, to run a half marathon, comma, and to get good at poaching eggs. Right. So a person could argue and say, well, you don't need that last comma, because some people are saying that's not necessary. We're going to get rid together. of the Oxford comma. Mm -hmm. Now, the example we have up on the screen is why <laughs> the Oxford comma should continue to be used. My heroes are my parents, comma, Superman and Wonder Woman. It completely changes if you put a comma right after Superman. Right. So and did you mean right. that you, you, your parents are your heroes and your parents happen to be Superman and Wonder Woman, or do you have three heroes, your parents being one, Superman being another, and Wonder Woman being the third? Right. So flip up to the last graphic here. Um, I was shocked by this. I was too. I... Younger people are using the Oxford comma. Well, I'm not necessarily younger, but I am a big fan of the Oxford comma, and I'm always, always correcting things. So well, the, yeah, but us. the 18 to 29-year-olds are, are big on it, which I was shocked at. Yep. You and I are, are probably in favor of it, even though we're in the, the third category. Yep. Um, probably just because we're sticklers on stuff like that. Exactly, and nerdy. That's yeah, probably true. So I'm, uh, you know what? But isn't There's... it interesting that the younger you are, the more likely you are I don't to get prefer it. the guy? I don't it doesn't get make it. sense. It goes against everything I believe about millennials and Gen Zers. Well, I'm here to tell you they're going to surprise you on a lot of things. I mean, well, they're surprising me. This, all this the is time. one I'm happy about being surprised. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Go Oxford, comma. Yes, that's all true. Oxford, comma. It's a good thing. I have right. always, always used it in in any type of writing that I've used. So I do a lot of commercials, and so I put commas in all the time on my <laughs> scripts. I just do. All right, so we are going to be back. We've got an interesting segment up next. We're going to talk about vaccine updates. Be with us in a minute here. Hi, right, folks. It's the Catalan Cafe. I reckon it's time you're due for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at a salad bar. Sink your teeth into our famous Catalan burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a calm roll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes these roads are the best in the county. Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink from trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com. My wife was diagnosed with uh, early stage Alzheimer's. We talked about it and we kind of decided we'd be a little bit proactive and try to start making provisions. So we started looking here and uh, even tied worked out to be pretty much the perfect answer. I guess I, I didn't expect it to be so nice. The staff here were terrific. We enjoy it. They say, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. At OK Tire, we're here to keep you going. From Firestone tires and replacements, to retreads and even Firestone tracks, we have you covered. 
Our certified Firestone experts are ready to get you back up and running, no matter if you're on site or in the field, saving you time and money. OK Tire, we keep the tough going. Now is the best time to plan for your 2021 farm equipment needs. North Dakota-based Summers Manufacturing is currently offering early order savings. Take advantage of big savings on North America's broadest tillage line, including the Super Colder Samurai and the innovative BRT Renegade, as well as the best-built, best-backed land rollers in the industry. Talk to your Summers dealer today or go to summersmfg.com to learn more about early order savings available on all Summers equipment. Welcome back to No Apologies on Beck. We are at our last segment already. It just flies, doesn't it? I yeah. mean, I'm finding that the more we do this television show, the faster it seems to be going. And I don't know if that's, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah it is, <laughs> I think so. So our last topic is? Vaccines. 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 We're gonna talk a little bit. Well, you got a lot of information today if you were watching the. I, yes, I, I watched the governor's presser today. Um, that was, that was a struggle, it always is, but um, I watched it. I sacrificed for you. <laughs> Thank you for taking one for the team. So I watched the whole thing. There are a couple of different vaccines, and it seems to me that storage might be a problem for these vaccines. The more I read about it, the more I think it's going to be difficult to keep them um, viable and okay because it's a short period of time and they have to stay very, very cold. Yep. Well, right. There are two vaccines that are that are out. I mean, we're, we're Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine we have now, people are getting it. There's, there's between 800, 900 healthcare workers that already received it right. in North Dakota. Um, and the Pfizer vaccine is the one that has to be kept at, I forget, is it? It's like 956 degrees or something below. It was like, all right, I'm sorry. No, it was minus 158. Yes. <laughs> yep. Wrong one. Like, I mean, so cryo was la last show, so <laughs> got it. Right. Okay, you're right. So 158 it, minus 158. Right, and it, it uh, can only be in the fridge for a couple of days. Five days. Yep, and if it's out of the fridge, it lasts six hours. Right. Right. Now, the Moderna vaccine is one that we're going to be getting next week in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. That one does not need to be nearly as cold. It's good in the fridge for 30 days. So it's a much easier to handle, mm -hmm. uh, much more likely to be something that can go out to many different types of facilities besides just the ones that have the ultra cold storage. So right. I think that's gonna be beneficial. Well, there are many, many in South Dakota, for instance, who may not even have storage availability for mm -hmm. minus 156, so right. 100, minus 158. So we, so we received 6,825 Pfizer vaccine mm -hmm. doses. For North Dakota? Right, we're getting 13,200 of the Moderna uh, next week, and that, that's at least what's expected. Mm -hmm. They're focusing on healthcare workers. Now here, here's, I have a little bit of heartburn about how they're doing it. Um, well, first off, you know, I've got heartburn <laughs> on a lot of things, but I'm gonna tell you one of my, one, so don't, let me get back to that. Okay. I have heartburn over the way this is being rolled out because when I watched the presser today, I felt I was watching Soviet era propaganda. The, 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 the way it's fed to us and repeated over and over and over and over that this is not for you, but by getting the vaccine, you are telling other people how much you care about them. That was repeated endlessly, endlessly. Now, so implying the flip side is yeah. that if you don't, you don't care about people. Yeah, if you don't want the vaccine, you yeah. don't care about that's other people. The, uh, that's the unspoken implied. Right, so then that carries me to the other part that give, is giving me heartburn is that the healthcare workers, which I, I it makes sense. If, if, you're, if you're wanting to do the vaccine and you're a healthcare worker, you're exposed to it a lot. It right. makes sense that you w would be, you know, ahead of people that aren't frontline, sure. don't have. Sure. But here's the problem is that they're ahead of long-term care Residents, oh. those people are being severely adversely affected. But those so people it's, are the ones who are being tested the, twice a week right now. Right. The concern I have is when the healthcare workers are are doing it and saying, "I'm doing this not for me, but for other people." Well, I think if long-term care, elderly, sick, comorbidity people were to receive that vaccine instead of you, they're probably not going to die. So I don't know. I, I'm not judging. I'm just saying this whole uh, morally superior 
concept of how this is framed for mm -hmm. people to get the vaccine. I just don't agree with it. If you want to get the vaccine, more power to you. It's the same with the flu vaccine. Uh, if you want to get that, great. It's fan it, 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 I'm glad that you can have it. If you're subjected, if you're at high risk, then get it. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. But it doesn't make you a morally superior human being by virtue of being one of the first people to get the vaccine. That isn't an automatic thing. Right. Now, you did mention, too, that that some people would be interested in getting it, some would not. And uh, I looked at those numbers. In May, it was two-thirds of people were interested yes. in taking it. And then now in September, it's down to half of the people would say that they would get the, the vaccine, which right. is really an interesting trend in a very short amount of time. Yes. There are a couple things I want to bring up from watching today. Okay. One is, well, first off, people need to know you need two doses of the vaccine. Right, we didn't say one. that yet, did no, we? No, we did okay. not. So three weeks two. apart for Pfizer, four weeks apart for Mo right. Moderna. You need two vaccines for it to be effective. Moderna possibly partially effective with one. Right. So you need to know that. Then the question is, how long does it last? The answer is, we're not sure, um, but at least two months. And then the other part, um, you know what? We're going to bring that up another day. Yeah, I think so. Because too. there's one other part that you've got to hear. It's unbelievable, and that's going to do it for tonight on <laughs> vaccines. There's so much. There's just so much. So Absolutely. So next. All right. Next show, we are going to be uh, having a fantastic talk about the 2021 session and its hot topics. We'll, we'll talk Join about that. Join us then, that. and next on Beck is No Filter with Debbie. See us tomorrow night.